at the crossroad. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Thank you for tuning in. I'm old enough to remember the the moon landing, the lunar landing. Me too. I was I was young enough to be really nerdy about it, <laughs> <laughs> but old enough to uh, to understand what was going on. Um, so we're celebrating 50 years since we uh, first stepped on the moon. We we don't say we did it, like you know. Yeah. You know, like, like we had anything to do with it, you know. <laughs> Uh, well, I suppose as a country we did. It's, it's a fair thing to say. But anyway, this Saturday is the 50th anniversary. We have on the phone uh, Roger D. Lanius. He is um, the author of a book called Apollo's Legacy, Perspectives on the Moon Landings. He's also the former chief historian for NASA. He's the associate director of collections and curatorial affairs at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Talk about credentials. He worked as a civilian historian with the United States Air Force as well. Roger uh, Lanius, it's an honor to have you on our show. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. And me three. I was in the same category with you all and the moon landings. Is that right? How old were you when the, and let's see, what that would have been 69, right? I was 69. I had just turned 15 years old. Oh, so I was 14. Where, where did you live at the time? I lived in Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, South Carolina. I, I was in New York at the time. I remember going out to the sidewalk, looking up at the moon, saying, there's somebody up there right now. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Absolutely. We were looking at the moon, uh, listening to the broadcast on the radio. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Those were the days. And, and, you know, what we wonder is why did that all stop? And we have so many different theories and conspiracy theories included. Um, does the book set us straight with some of those things that we were misled? Well, hopefully it, it, it sets a straight on some of these things. Yeah. I mean, the reality was the accomplishment of the moon landings was one of the truly remarkable events in human history. Um, but it was done for a very specific issue at the time, and that was to resolve uh, a, a sense around the world that the United States was lagging behind the Soviet Union in science and technology. And it, it's that Cold War environment that's really what sparked the money that was possible to make it uh, to make it so that NASA could land on the moon and the astronauts could go there six times. Oh wow! Without so, without that Cold War crisis, it probably wouldn't have happened. At least not in the way it did. This is not interesting. So there's a lot to be said for competition, right? I think competition makes us all better, right? <laughs> Uh, competition is always a good thing. It brings out the best in who and in, in whatever's uh, around and whoever's engaged in that. There's no question. So, was there a fear that Russia was doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, and they might get there a day earlier? Well, it wasn't just a day earlier. This was about uh, the future belongs to the people who can master science and technology. That was true in the 1960s, and everybody recognized it. It's still true today. And, uh, and because of that, this uh, Cold War struggle between the Americans and the Russians, the winner of that was going to be the nation that had the best science technology. And it looked like through the 1950s and into the 60s that the Russians were ahead. We had to do something to catch up. Uh, the space race was a, was a major vehicle for that. And... It really did set the record straight on this. Uh, you know, the Russians had some capabilities, but nothing what the Americans had. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, conspiracy theories, though. I mean, even to go so far as the denial of the moon landing, they even made a few movies out of it. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, we love conspiracy theories as Americans. Maybe everybody in the world does, but certainly Americans do. There is not a major event that takes place where somebody doesn't come back out, out with some sort of counter um, explanation of it and one in which there's some sort of conspiratorial activity that's engaged. And we see it in film, we see it on the Internet, we see it pretty much everywhere. So it doesn't surprise me that this is the case for the moon landings as well. It's a very small group of people who are in this category. They are, of course, quite vocal, but nonetheless, it's not a large group. 
in as you as a historian, were you able to do research that uncovered things that even you didn't know about? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I did not have an appreciation um, for the complexity of the of the technology that had to be developed uh, to go to the moon before I really started working on this project. And and it, it's not that we didn't have rockets in the 1960s. We did, but they were much much smaller and less complex, and they tended to blow up a, a fair number of times. So the Saturn V was an enormous accomplishment. It's still the biggest rocket ever developed. Uh, it flew uh, successfully every single time, and of course it took the astronauts to the moon uh, on a, a total of nine times, uh, three circumlunar flights and, and, uh, and six landings. Wow, that's amazing. All of the research that you're able to do uh, seem to come with your expertise as a, a curator for the Smithsonian and also all the interviews that you did. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, obviously, um, I was able to talk to a lot of people who were associated with this program. I mean, it was a, and it was no question about it, a group effort. At, at its height, more than four hundred thousand people are engaged in the uh, in the race to the moon, and uh, uh, and they are literally all over the country, and in some cases around the world, uh, as they were engaged in these in the single-minded effort to put Americans on the moon. Was was the uh, the end of the program uh, because we had accomplished the goal you had established earlier or was it because we were um, out of money or was there political uh, pushback against it? Uh, all of the above. Um, you know, the, the objective uh, stated in 1961 by John Kennedy was put a, uh, put a man on the moon and return him safely to the earth by the end of the decade. So they accomplished that with Apollo 11, and they could have stopped at that point and declared victory, and that, and, and that would have satisfied the mandate. Uh, they didn't do that. They carried on with a program that was more expansive and, 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 and more successful overall and scientifically valid uh, because of, of all of the experiments, especially on the last three missions to the moon. But, um, but politically, there were, uh, there were those who were on both the political left and the political right who believed that spending money in this way uh, was probably a poor use of that funding, and we could do other things with it that would be better, and you can name the program of your choice, um, and they came out all over the place in terms of where that money should go, or maybe it goes back to the American people as a tax cut. Yeah. Those were all possibilities, and, and politically, the crisis had passed, the Americans had demonstrated their capabilities before the world, uh, so there was not the political will to continue on with a very aggressive program, spending a large amount of the federal budget to accomplish these ends. The result of that was um, that uh, the last mission was December of 72. NASA had plans to do a whole lot more. Uh, their post-Apollo plans included a space shuttle, a space station, and that from that space station they were going to create a moon base and ultimately a mission to Mars. Uh, but they weren't able to do all of those. Only one came out of this effort, and that was the space shuttle in 1972. But but we do have a space station. Is that space station not serving the same uh, the same thing that we yeah, have? Yeah. Yeah, it is, but it was later. I mean, that, the approval for the space station took place in 1984, uh, and of course, it uh, was built um, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And um, and the U.S. has had a crew up there since. 2000. Uh, the book is called Apollo's Legacy. Is there um, a story behind the name? Why was it called Apollo? Well, Apollo was uh, obviously it's uh, out of mythology, mm -hmm. uh, and most of the early NASA programs, uh, certainly Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, were all named uh, uh, for mythical figures, and uh, and so there seems to be a nice uh, set of symbolism there. Uh -huh, okay. uh, and of course, and NASA's current effort to try to return to the moon is being called uh, Artemis, which is the twin sister of Apollo, and uh, we'd all like to see that happen too. Oh, I didn't know that. What's it called again? Artemis. It's called Artemis. 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 Okay, I didn't know that. Oh, that is a cool little yeah. fact to know. So, so what, did you write about the astronauts themselves in the book? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, the astronauts were uh, this very attractive group of people that uh, 
became public figures and celebrities uh, in, in an era in which uh, you know three networks dominated television, and you would see these these guys, and they were all guys at that time, uh, show up on. And this will be a name that younger listeners will not know on the Ed Sullivan show, <laughs> uh, on uh, various other television programs where they would banter with uh, the hosts and make a few jokes and then talk about how we're going to the moon and how important it was. Uh, and, and they were a, 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 a good group in a whole lot of ways. Um, they were essentially the avatars for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as good they way. moved forward toward the moon. Yeah, a good way of putting that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we all kind of felt that way. If you, you sort of, there was a, uh, I think there was some, we lived not too far, well, hundreds something miles from Kennedy Space mm -hmm. Center, but we've been there, in other words. There was a place mm -hmm. there where you could feel the, uh, the, the not the soil, but the, the, the texture of the moon. They had something down there. I remember you could feel what it felt like. It was really kind of a right. different kind of a powdery, but more consistent than powder and, and not quite sand. It was kind of a weird feeling, and you, you tried to imagine what it was like to step in that. I don't know why that's important to us, but it was. <laughs> well, that, 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 um, uh, 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 that moon dust simulant that you were able to feel uh, is something that NASA's been working on a long time, because we, we have to figure out if we're going to go back to the moon and stay there for any length of time and, and, and do something there and maybe put a moon base up and so forth. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to operate in that environment. And that, and that dust is a really difficult thing. It gets in everything. All of the astronauts talked about how it, it tended to stick to their suits, and they had these metal pieces in there uh, that, uh, that fit the gloves onto the, onto the sleeves and various things like that. And those, that, that dust got gunked up in there and it was hard to open things of that nature we got to figure out how to deal with that if we're going to go back did they bring some of that back or did they just bring full rocks oh no no they brought they brought back soil they brought back dust they brought back rocks uh about 840 pounds worth altogether oh my are we going to be able to coexist on our exploring of the moon if other countries are up there also. Imagine that. Well, yeah. I'd like to think so. Um, you, you know, I, I think that what we're going to see with the exploration and use of the moon is, uh, is going to be something like what you see in Antarctica, uh, where you've got mm. multiple nations, each of them with various research stations and activities taking place there. And we, we sort of decided that you know, we're going to operate at a certain place and somebody else is going to operate at another place. And, and there's an overarching sort of group that, uh, that manages uh, interactions between these, uh, these entities. And I, I think that's what we'll see on the moon as well. well. We received the PDF of your book, and you not only have um, your uh, research from people within NASA and the everyday operations themselves, but also from people on the outside. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was very pleased that uh, that uh, a number of folks uh, liked the book and were willing to weigh in to say something about it, and uh, and they include uh, people like Charlie Bolden, who's the ex NASA administrator and himself was a, a shuttle astronaut, and Doug Brinkley, who's published a very fine book on the Kennedy uh, effort to, uh, to go to the moon called American Moonshot. Mm -hmm. uh, so. You know, very pleased about all that. Well, Larry had a news story last week about the recreation of uh, the um, uh, oh gosh, what what did what, what was the name of it of, of uh, Mission Control from the way it was back then? <laughs> oh yeah, and that was a pretty cool story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Mission Control, um, you know, uh, that that facility was created initially for the Gemini program in the mid 1960s and it's been modified and changed over time and they built a whole new one in the 1990s uh, and sort of mothballed what existed but now they have restored one of the earlier mission controls to what it looked like at the time of Apollo and that is a really great thing uh, and, and an example of how we can uh, sort of preserve our history about this truly exciting event. 
You have devoted your life to this primarily. I was, I was looking through the titles of some of your other books, and a good 90% uh, are about space travel, space exploration. you got a baseball game, a baseball book in there, too, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of baseball books and some other things as well. But, <laughs> but yes, no, I, I mean, I've, I've earned my living um, uh, doing the history of space flight, and I'm very proud to have been associated with that all these years and I continue to do it now in retirement but uh, uh, but this is uh, this is sort of a capstone project for me to talk about Apollo which is the the greatest event in space flight history and actually one of the greatest Absolutely. events in history. It, it is truly an amazing story one of the things that comes up a lot I may, maybe to support going back to the moon is all of the things that we use in everyday life that would not exist if it were not for the science that needed to be understood in order to go to the moon. Are there any, yeah. uh, can you tell me some of those things? I, I think I remember the camera on the smartphone is one of them, or, or the lens or something. Well, the CTD that's used, it's ubiquitous today in, uh, in our camera technology is, is uh, something that was uh, developed not just for spaceflight, but certainly it was a major user of that activity. You know, there's a lot of things that you can point to. There's never a straight line between what was used in in NASA and what the commercial product is. But um, but some of them, I think, are are, are pretty exciting, and I'll, I'll point to one um, in particular. So the astronauts, uh, the flight surgeons who were concerned about the health of the astronauts, needed to be able to monitor them while they were on their trips to the moon. And uh, this made, uh, they built these bio-harnesses that um, uh, allowed you to measure their, you know, their blood pressure, their, their, uh, their uh, heart rate, uh, you know, various other aspects of the vital signs, and send that back to Earth uh, a pretty long distance away. Mm. And... Any heart patient today knows about those things because so they've all been hooked up to them. Uh, and so the, uh, the the monitoring that takes place uh, if yeah. you're in the ICU or even if you're in rehab uh, is a part of some of that technology that has found its way into That's, everyday life. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. They figured out how to do that even. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I never knew about Gene Krantz until the movie um, Apollo, 13. Apollo 13. He yeah. was a very interesting personality i did some more research on him and uh, you never ever heard about a leader within the group on the ground until that movie came out right right yeah well i mean gene was one of uh, several of the flight directors they, they, they were they were in shifts they operated in shifts and they had a and they had a flight director for each of those shifts and gene was one of those and um uh, and, and he became quite famous during apollo 13 and of course the film features him as well uh, and and each of these individuals not just not just Gene but all of them were very very strong figures they were good engineers and they they ruled that uh, that flight control system center um, uh, with uh, uh, not necessarily an iron hand but certainly a strong hand uh, to make sure that everybody did um, exactly what was needed and they followed the path and of course the famous line that's in the film which Gene never actually said, but he has admitted he wish he had said, was failure is not an option. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's uh, a true statement, even if he actually never said it. <laughs> uh, so is there any way to talk about the future? What do you, what do you think we'll see in the upcoming years uh, re with the space program? Well, I'd like to think that we'll see a return to the moon sometime in the not-too-distant future. Uh, the... Uh, the current administration has uh, has uh, tasked NASA with the objective of reaching the moon by 2024. That's a tall order, and it's going to require some serious investment of resources, which thus far have not come in the in the form of of, of appropriations to NASA yet, although they may in the, in the near term. And um, but even if it's you know, 2030 or sometime like that, I'd like to think that before I'm gone, uh, we will have another astronaut and maybe even a, a, a base on the moon. And I think that's a possibility and a probability. We, we talked earlier. Uh, we're 
we talked. Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we talked earlier about the the competition between Russia and the U.S. being a, right. a big reason why we were able to do it. Do you think the competition we're seeing now between private companies? Do you think that'll spur it on a little bit? Not between private companies, but I think other nations. Uh, there is a, uh, a sort of a, a groundswell, if you will, of uh, of interest in returning to the moon and. Uh, and it's being uh, it's being pursued right now by various nations. There was supposed to be a launch of a robotic probe yesterday that had to get uh, scrubbed, and presumably we'll see that again in the next few days. But um, other nations are starting to engage in this activity. There's a there's a sense that there are resources on the moon that can be utilized, and um, and if we are and the nation that's able to exploit those uh, will be in a commanding position in the future, and that's. That's one of the things that's taking place right now. So I think that will spark more activity mm. by the Americans. The one you just referred to, that was out of India, right? That, is that right? That, the one yesterday was supposed to be an Indian probe. And there are others from other nations that are being ready right now. Wow. The book is called Apollo's Legacy. It's written by Roger D. Launius, and I found it on Amazon. You're getting really good reviews. Do you have a website you'd like to direct us to? Uh, just go to the uh, Smithsonian Books website. Uh, it's a very simple one. And, um, and if anybody wants to follow my blog, they may do so. And it's simply just type into Google Roger Lanius's blog, and you will get there. Roger, what a fascinating topic. We could have talked a lot longer. I am still a nerd at heart, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Roger. <laughs> thank you for talking to us today. Hey, my pleasure. All right, Take we'll, care. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Fox News, I'm Lillian Wu. The Trump administration taking action on asylum protection. The new rule... Bars migrants from seeking asylum in the U.S. if they've traveled through another country first. The rule is aimed at the tens of thousands of migrant families from Central America.